Hi, well, I want to, I'm Rob Lazarsov, chair of the math department. I want to uh, welcome everybody to the Simons Lectures this year. Um, we're very pleased to have Martin Hara, one of the world's leading stochastic analysts uh, from Imperial College, who's going to give this series of three lectures. Um, Professor Hara got his degree from uh, the University of Geneva in 2001. And um, since then, as I'm sure everybody knows, he's won many prizes. He won the Whitehead Prize in 2008 the Fields Medal in 2014. The same year he was elected Fellow of the Royal Society. And um, two years ago, he was made Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire. So I'm very pleased. So I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Herr, who's going to talk about bridging scales. Thanks. Thanks for this introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation to give these lectures. Pleasure to be here again. Um, so I thought. So today, the plan is to give more of a sort of colloquium style talk. Um, it's going to be more sort of motivational for the subject uh, to give you an idea of where these objects kind of come from. Um, so to start off, first things first. Oh, um, so. In, Probability theory, so of course probability theory as a mathematical subject, um, it essentially deals with somehow transforming probabilities, right? I mean, you essentially assume that you're given some probability measure on some probability space somewhere, uh, and then you actually start constructing all sorts of random variables on that space, uh, and you might be interested in the law of random variables. So you essentially can transform probabilities mostly. Um, which obviously begs the question of, you know, where do they come from in the first place? Do want some sort of a priori way of assigning probabilities to things? Um, and there are essentially two principles that allow you to do that. And the first one, as usual, is symmetry. And there, that basically just says that, you know, if you have, a, if you have an experiment in which you don't have enough information to be able to predict the outcome uh, with certainty. And you have several possible outcomes that are distinguishable to you as an observer, but that are equivalent as far as the mechanism that produces these outcomes are concerned. Right. Um, then it's natural that. to assign, sorry? They're equivalent or inequivalent to you? They are inequivalent to you, so you can distinguish them but the mechanism that produces them cannot distinguish them. Okay, and then it's, then it's natural to assign the same probability. Okay, so the example is a coin toss. Right, so if you, you toss a coin, it comes up head or tails, you can distinguish between head and tails, but the mechanism of spinning the coin doesn't see whether it's head on one side or on the other side. Right? So, so in those kind of situations, you would want to assign the same probability <laughs> the two possible outcomes, if we have six possible outcomes because we will die, you just have the same problem with six possible outcomes, etc. Um, of course, it's slightly trickier when you have infinitely many possible outcomes. Um, and the second guiding principle uh, is universality. And again, you all know one specific example of universality, uh, which is the central limit theorem. All right, so what does the central limit theorem tell you? It tells you that if you take independent random variables, they don't even need to be the same. They just need to be sort of roughly the same, and you add them up. So if you add, add up many independent random quantities, uh, then what you see, if you rescale it so it becomes over one, is always going to look like a gash. Right? Um, and that's been observed already ages ago, so the Gaussian was computed in the was back in the Noir or Laplace, who essentially discovered Stirling's formula by trying to compute um, the probabilities for successive time process. Uh, but this, so this universality business is much more general. Okay, so it's more general in the sense that very often when you're in a situation where you have a the one complicated random outcome that comes, that is produced out of many different random inputs, uh, but maybe in a more sophisticated way than simply adding them up. Um, 
then very often what comes out doesn't really depend very much on the details of what you put in. And so then in that sense, you know, that somehow justifies your probabilities a priori in the sense that you just don't really care so much about the actual model that you start with, right? Because what you get out, the idea is that what comes out in the end uh, for interesting observables actually doesn't really depend on the model anyway, as long as you're in a, you know, in a large class of models that's supposed to model a given uh, type of situation. And so in this lecture, I want to mostly focus on this second principle. And so let me give an, another example, which is essentially like the souped up version of the central limit theorem. Okay. And so that's what happens if, again, you have, say, successive coin tosses, uh, and you simply add them up. Okay, so you get one if you heads and minus one for tails. Or if you want every time you toss a coin, you make a step to the right if you get head, to the left if it's tail. Um, and then you do many of these. Um, after many steps, you're going to be well, quite far from where you started, but if you risk it, it becomes over one, then your position is going to be distributed according to a Gaussian. But now what you do is you keep track of the whole movement, not just the end location. And you want to describe actually this whole movement. And historically, somehow, the, uh, the example which motivated this was an observation by Brown. Um, actually, he wasn't the first to do that observation, but he's the one whose name is um, who observed sort of pollen in water and noticed that it sort of moved erratically uh, under the microscope. And the explanation that was given was that well, water, water molecules hit the grain of pollen, and so the pollen essentially does a random walk. So every time a water molecule hits from one side, it moves a little bit in the other direction, and vice versa. Uh, the individual, the, the effect of the individual collisions is very, very small, but you have many, many, many of them. And so it adds up to something macroscopic that you can work on the microscope. And that was described um, well, it was made more quantitative actually by Einstein and Smolchowski back in 1905. Um, and, well, what they saw is, so what Einstein and Smolchowski did is that they, they argued that a good way of describing this was given by the heat equation. So, so what does the heat equation model here? The heat equation models the probability density of observing that uh, little grain of pollen at a given location at a given time. Okay, so that gives you some, some function that integrates to one, which somehow spreads out in time because the pollen will, sort of on average, move further and further away from the starting point, and the way it spreads out is described by the heat equation. And but more or less simultaneously, so that's Smolchowski, by the way. So that's actually, I didn't put a picture of Einstein because everybody knows what Einstein looks like. <laughs> so the, uh, about the same time, actually a little bit earlier, Bachelier, and there are not many pictures of him, that's pretty much the only picture you can find on the web. Um, what he was interested in was the evolution of stock prices. And so then he told a story which was almost identical you know, to the story that explains Brown emotion, uh, except that now your grain of pollen or so is the stock price, and the water molecules that hit it are people buying and selling shares. Right? So every time every time you buy a share, you create a little bit more demand, so the price will go up. Every time you sell it, uh, you create a bit less demand, or the price is going down. Every single trade has a very little effect on the price, but there are many, many trades. And so you see a macroscopic effect on the price, and that's what you see when you look at the prices in the financial times. Okay, and uh, locally somehow over, so if you discard like exceptional events, like you know, stock market crashes or whatever, Donald Trump doing his latest stupid thing. Uh, <laughs> then, you know, if you discard these sort of events, then the evolution is pretty much 
is very well modeled again by this Barney motion, at least Gilcom, right? Uh, because, well, it's essentially the same mechanism that produces it. But on the other hand, if you, you know, if you really wanted, in both cases, if you wanted to do an actual realistic model, you know, of the real mechanism producing this, they would look very, very different, right? I mean, in one case, you would start modeling the individual water molecules and so on. In the other case, you would start modeling the behavior of uh, agents buying and selling the stock. You would end up with quite different models, but you know, at these kind of large scales, when you look at the effect over long times of many interactions, both models will actually give essentially the same outcome. Okay, so that's the This is not really a souped-up central limit theorem, is it? Sorry? This is not a souped-up central limit theorem, is it? It is a souped-up central limit theorem because it's just at fixed time, at any fixed time, it's basically a central limit theorem. Yeah, right. Right? And so it's really just lots of little central limit theorems that are pieced together over every sort of mesoscopic time interval. Okay? And that gives you the motion. And that's actually, right, that's why it's related to the heat equation, because the Green's function of the heat equation, the heat kernel at any fixed T, is just the Gaussian. Right? And so that's how it shows up. Um, now, of course, both of these works had a, quite a big impact. So the, uh, the work by Einstein Smoluchowski was actually then experimentally verified by Perrin, who got the Nobel Prize for that in 26. Uh, and the work was actually basically led the foundation for sort of modern math finance, uh, like the work of Dan for example. Now, mathematically, like, well, <laughs> good point. <laughs> <laughs> no, no playing no bell for that one. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> um, now, mathematically, this brand new motion, right, so how would you want to model that mathematically? You want to basically build a probability measure on a space of continuous functions, right? Because you want to actually consider the whole trajectory as your random variable. And so you want to build a probability measure on the space of continuous function, which is somehow related to the heat equation, or it's in the way that I described. Um, and that's what Wiener did in the late 20s, okay? So uh, he managed to prove that you can build this measure and that it's somehow uniquely determined by kind of the specifications uh, that come out of the least description I'll be able to read this slide. Um, and so then what you get is a random continuous function which sort of looks like this. Okay, so that's typical. So you get a probability measure on the space of continuous function. And now if you take a typical continuous function under that probability measure, it somehow looks like um, actually, I have a nicer, I have an animated version of this. Right, so now this is, again, it's just one sample from that probability measure. Okay, so you have this probability measure on functions from R to R. You pick one at random, so I draw it here. And then all I do is take that single function and I zoom out. Okay. And so I just show you the same continuous function at larger and larger scales. Um, and what you see is it kind of always looks the same, right? <laughs> Which is a very important point. <laughs> okay, so it always looks the same, not in the sense that the picture is static, right? So it keeps on moving, but in the sense that, you know, if I took a snapshot here, you wouldn't be able to tell me whether I took that snapshot now or 10 seconds ago or in 10 seconds from now, right? So statistically, it always kind of looks the same. Um, and the point of these two parabolas here is that the way I'm zooming out is the way that keeps these two parabolas constant. Okay, so if I zoom out by a certain factor horizontally, I zoom out by the square root of that factor. Right. Um, so, so what we say here is that so Brownian motion is self-similar with self -sim with similarity exponent a half, the one half. Is how do you formulate precisely that it looks the same? Uh, that the law is the same. So you take the law of Brownian motion, you look at the image of that law under the operation that simply rescales. For any event in measure? For, well, so, so you just take the push forward of the measure under the oh, map that forward. takes a function and you know rescales it. And under any value of the rescaling, you get the same measure. 
the law is the same. The law is the same. <coughs> Okay, and uh, and so then to just to wrap up the history of primary emotions, Amal Donsker, somewhere in the 50s, he proved, he was maybe one of the first to prove some kind of universality result in the sense that you know, he really proved that if you, that you have this functional version of the central disk. Right? If you take a random walk and you keep track of the whole trajectory, you will get things that converge to a random motion in law. Um, and that's actually true. I mean, that's been extended because you know, in much more general situations. You don't really need independence. You don't really need identical distribution, etc. And it's true in uh, quite large generalities. But now, okay, so Brownian motion is an example of a random function from R to R. So now what happens if you replace R by R2, okay, the first R? The domain. Okay, so what would be a natural? So what would be a, the analog of a random walk on Z two? Okay, so a random walk on Z. Another way of viewing it is to say, well, a random walk it's simply a function from the integers to the integers, which has the property that it always changes by exactly either plus one or minus one. Okay, so either step up or step down, and they all have the same probability. All so now you can do the same thing on Z2. You, so, so you take a bypass that lattice, like that one, or simply the usual Z2 lattice, that one's pretty. Um, and then you look at all possible functions from this lattice into the integers, which have the property that neighboring values differ by exactly either plus one or minus one. Okay. Um, and you need the lattice to be bipartite because otherwise you don't have any such function. Um, and then you just say, well, okay, so you pick one at random. You give them all the same probability, you pick one at random, what do you get if you make the lattice very large? So that would be a natural two-dimensional analog of the random wall. Um, and here the situation already gets trickier. Right? So first, well, it turns out that even in this simple case, there's no theorem. Um, there are other no situations. Theory. There's no theorem that states, well, do what I just said, rescale, here no. is the limiting object. But we know what the limiting object is. Okay, so there's a conjecture, and you can check it with the simulations, and it works. Um, interesting, the scaling, the scaling exponent in this case is actually zero. The scaling exponent is zero. So the correct way of rescaling it is you scale the screen, so you scale your domain, but you don't scale the values. Right? Like in the case of the random walk, we scale the domain and we scale the values by the square root, as in the central limit theorem, where you have to rescale by the square root of that. So here you don't scale at all. So you just you scale the domain, but you don't scale the values. This is presumably related to the naive engineering dimension of the engine. Yes, exactly. Um, See, you usually think of a random walk as a map from Z to the grid, or if you think of a map from the grid to Z, what, what is the relationship? Uh, so here the relationship is just the one that I view it as a I view it as a random function whose value, the, which is such that the difference between neighboring values is always exactly plus or minus one. So I take this as my definition of the random walk from Z to Z, and then this definition generalizes if I change the domain. So of course I could also just change the target value, but for the random walk that's not so interesting because you simply get independent. So each component there will just independent and you just get a bunch of random walks. Uh, was this generalization, it's not so obvious what you can. So it's sort of like a random surface. It's like a random surface, exactly. Rather than a random path. That's right. Yeah. Um, and so here what you get then is something like this. So this is a color plot, if you want, of the random surface that you get, where color is the height. Um, 
And you see, well, you see, since I didn't scale anything vertically, you think, well, you can't converge to a limit because, well, either it's somehow you would imagine that if there is some freedom, then the values are going to get somehow larger and larger, and so if you rescale it, you're going to get infinitely big values. And that's true. And so what happens here is that the limit, you're limiting random surface, you want is not a continuous function, uh, it's just a distribution. Okay, so the limiting random surface is really just a random distribution on, uh, on our tool, um, which is, in some sense, it's almost a function. I mean, it's a random distribution which is almost as close to being as functional uh, as it gets, uh, but it really isn't one. So you cannot evaluate it at points. The only thing you can do is take averages. Um, and so you should think this picture, well, every pixel, for every pixel, you take somehow the average over a little box, and then you follow the pixel according to that average. But if I make these boxes smaller and smaller, then the values that I get actually get larger and larger. Can you evaluate on curves at almost all points of the curve? So you can, you can evaluate on curves, and then you get a distribution of the curve. So if your curve is sufficiently nice, uh, so if it's a a differential the curve, uh, then you can evaluate, you can restrict it to a curve. That's what we find. Um, it gets tricky if the curve itself is kind of unless it's independent. Um, and so here you can formally you can write down what you're supposed to get. So what you're supposed to get is a probability measure on random fields which has somehow density e to the minus this kind of energy um, into the, the gradient square with respect to the back measure, which doesn't exist. Um, and so what I did here is I simply simulated this. So this is a perfectly well-defined object. One can make sense of this. It defines a perfectly nice probability measure on the space of distributions. And it's conjectured to be the limit of, you know, most models of the type that I just described, and that's proven for a whole bunch of them, but just not for that one specifically. Which that the one? For that model, so for that example. So for that specific example, there's no theorem that says that it converges, but there are other examples with similar flavor for which there are theorems. <coughs> now, in both of these cases, they were free in the sense that what we did is we, you know, cooked up some kind of model from integers to integers, um, and then maybe we put a bit of constraints, and then we just said, well, okay, so now pick one of these at random, where at random means uniform at random, same probability form. Now, the interesting systems that are not free, right? so one of the well, the most well-known system is the easy model. Um, so that one, now this time a configuration is a random function from the two-dimensional lattice into simply plus minus one. Okay, so not into all integers, really just plus minus one. Um, but this time instead of just picking one at random, which would not be terribly interesting, you bias them in favor of neighbors having the same value. Okay, so what you do is you look at this quantity, so you sum over all nearest neighbors this product, sigma x, sigma y, where sigma is your configuration, and now if sigma x is equal to sigma y, that's plus one, if it's unequal, it's minus one. Okay. Um, and so this quantity is big if many neighbors have the same value, and it's small if many neighbors have different values. Right. Um, and then you pick one of these configurations with a probability which is proportional to the exponential of this quantity. Uh, and now this time you have a parameter. This is beta in the exponential, which plays the role of a temperature, or the inverse temperature. So beta is one over temperature. And so it allows you to interpolate between situations where, so beta equal to zero 
means that you just pick one at random without caring of what the configuration looks like. And then what you get is something more or less like this. So this is what you get for small values of beta. Uh, it means, you know, essentially it looks close to what you would get if you simply pick, pick every single value of sigma independent. Actually, what you see here is that there is a little bit of structure at small scales, in the sense that neighboring pixels still do have a tendency of having the same value. You have sort of like little patches of yellow and then little patches of uh, black. And the size of these patches <coughs> somehow depends on the value of beta. Okay, so if beta is really equal to zero, the size of the patches would be kind of one, typically. Uh, as you increase beta, these patches get larger and larger. And now at some point, there's a critical value of beta at which the size of these patches somehow becomes infinite. Okay. Uh, so when you're above the critical value, in some sense, everything becomes one patch. Right? It means that essentially everything is either yellow with maybe a little bit of black inside, or everything is black with a little bit of yellow inside. But at, there's one specific value for beta, which is this critical value, where you see something interesting. Right? So you see somehow large yellow patches and large black patches, and there's no typical length scale anymore, in the sense that you have patches of arbitrarily large size, but it's not the case that everything is dominated by just one color in this case. Right? So you still have both colors showing up, uh, but both of them show up in sort of very large patches. And so here, you get again some self-similar behavior. So you can zoom out of this picture uh, and ask yourself again, is there a scaling limit? And I find a scaling experiment uh, so that there is a scaling limit. Here again, because the values are just plus minus one, because if you want to get any sort of limit, what you have to do is again look at the averages locally. And then, since locally it's going to more or less self average out, then you would have to actually increase the value by something that depends on the scale that you're looking at. So, this time, what this means is that this time the scaling exponent is negative. And so, in Brownian motion, it was a half. In case of that free field in two dimension, it was zero. Here, the scaling exponent is negative. It's but we know, minus a quarter, minus a eighth. So, uh, it's no one. Um, and there is a theorem, but here the theorem is extremely recent. So, just from a mathematical, uh, from a you know, theoretical physics point of view, uh, this has been known for quite some time. Basically, goes back to the eighties or so. Uh, from a rigorous mathematical point of view, the theorem goes back to um, by uh, Newman, Gabon, or Thomas, and I think there was a fourth. And they showed that this particular model on the square map, I think, uh, does have a scaling limit, and there's a characterization of the scaling limit, which coincides with what was predicted by physicists. Um, and again, the expectation is that this is universal in the sense that, well, for example, it shouldn't really depend on uh, detail of the lattice, and it should not actually even depend on the fact that you're looking at the easy model. To take any sort of model of the same type, which somehow models space coexistence and for which you have a phase transition. At some point, then at the value of the phase transition, you would expect to get the, scale, the same scaling limit with the same scaling exponents. There's absolutely no proof of that. Um, okay, so so we have these examples, right? So so what do they have in common, right? So I gave you these three examples uh, in which you have some discrete model where when you zoom out at large scales, you get some scaling limit, and the scaling limit is some kind of random universal object which has a number of properties. So in general, in the first two examples it was Gaussian in the sense that, okay, it's a random field, but somehow you look at 
any number of linear functionals of it, and then this gives you a point Gaussian variable. Um, in the third example, the example of the easy model, the limit is not Gaussian. Okay, so in general, these limits are not Gaussian. Well, the rule of thumb is that in free situations, uh, you get Gaussian limits. In non-free situations, you get non-Gaussian limits. Now, you have basically by construction, you have some scale invariance, simply because it was obtained as a scale invariance. Um, so like the Brownian motion, you remember the movie, so that's the scale invariance of Brownian motion. Um, you typically have a translation invariance because you start from something which is translation invariant, you take limits with something translation invariant. Um, you have some kind of, in all of the examples I gave you, there's some kind of locality which tells you that what goes on in one region of space uh, doesn't directly interact with another region far away. So it only somehow sees what happens in a little neighborhood. Uh, and that can be formalized. And in the limit, somehow this little neighborhood becomes <coughs> of infinitesimally small. And so that's formalized as a mark of property. These are all of these scaling limits. If, this, if you start from something which is somewhat local, it should become exactly local in the limit. That means it should have some kind of Markov property, some space-time Markov property. Um, and then in all these examples, actually, you also have rota rotation invariance of the limit, which is not completely obvious because you start from something which is not rotation invariant, right? So the limit might somehow remember the geometry of the lattice, uh, but in many cases it doesn't. And so then if it does, if that's the situation, so if you have translation and rotation invariance, well, you know, then it's natural to guess that you would actually have conformal invariance. Right? So that in some sense, scaling and rotation invariance holds locally. Uh, and then it means that you have conformal invariance. In two dimension, that buys you a lot. Right? So in two dimension, of course, the conformal group is very big. Uh, so knowing that you have conformal invariance buys you a lot. And so in two, in two dimension, quite a lot is known about these objects. So that's, for example, why for the 2D easing model, uh, in some sense, everything about that limit was already conjectured in the physics literature by essentially exploiting conformal invariants. Uh, and in recent years, there's been all this construction of these objects like SLE, QLE, CLE, etc. But they're essentially the probabilistic objects associated to two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, but if you're, if you're off two dimensions, or if you don't have this uh, two-dimensional conformal invariance, or for example, if you put dynamic on these models, so for example, the easing model, uh, I gave you a static picture. You just have a configuration which depends on Z2. There's a natural way of putting a time evolution on this picture. So you have an evolution in these kind of models. Um, and in that case, for example, even for the two-dimensional easing model, it's not known what the scaling limit is if you add time evolution. It's not even known what the exponents are. Okay, so you can do simulations of what I mean. If you go to the Wikipedia page for the easing model, it will give you a value for the exponent, but it's not a rational value, and it's a value that you just got by numerical simulations. So it's not a value for which there's a conjecture that the value is this. Can you say what the time evolution is? Um, so for example, one thing you can do is you can simply, uh, at every site, you have a clock that somehow rings at Poisson distributed times. And when the clock rings, you try to flip the value of the spin at that site. But what you do is you look at the, how much the energy changes and then depending if the energy, if your flip makes the energy decrease, then you just do it. And if it makes the energy increase, then with a certain probability, you discard the, the flip. Um, and you choose that probability in the right way so that the measure that I broke down is invalid. So that this model is really stationary for that. 
Okay, so that would be one natural evolution, it's called lava dynamic. There's another evolution where you put clocks on bonds, and instead of flipping the spins, you exchange neighboring spins, and then again, if the energy increases, you do it. If the energy increases, you do it only with a certain probability. You choose that in the right way. Um, and for example, with these two kind of dynamics, the scaling exponents that you would get, get a somehow limiting space-time dynamic, would be different. So you would not get the same time scaling exponent, even though at fixed time they're the same. Um, or for example, if you're in three dimension, if you take the easy model in three dimension, again, there's no theorem uh, about the scaling limit, there's no conjecture even about the value of the scaling exponent. Uh, from sense, the, there's a breakthrough result from about three or four years ago, which essentially conjectures a complicated procedure of approximating the value of the scaling exponent. So it's somehow at that level of knowing things. <clears throat> okay, so, so the conclusion, so the takeaway message here is that there are some specific situations where these scaling limits are quite well understood, and there are many other situations where they are very, very poorly understood. Okay, so that's somehow the take-home message. And so now what we'd like to do is to in some sense, you know, try to connect those scaling limits that are well understood to those that are not well understood. Okay. And so the idea here is to look at what's known as crossover regimes. And so what's a crossover regime? Well, imagine that instead of, in all the examples that I showed you, you had one fixed model, okay, so you fix that model, and then you zoom out and you look at the scaling. So now instead of taking one fixed model, you take a whole family of models. Okay, so you have a family of models that depends on the parameter. And there's one specific value of the parameter for which you understand the model well. Okay, so say there's one specific value of the parameter for which the model lies in one of these Gaussian universality classes. So that if you zoom out, you see something Gaussian. Okay, um, so, so here is a cartoon of what would go on. Right? So imagine here you take some physical situation. Uh, so here that's the example of somehow one-dimensional interface fluctuations, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so say this, a point on the screen here is a model. Okay, so every point is a different model. The evolution here is the operation of zooming out. So the scaling limits are fixed points under that evolution. Okay, because they have the property that if you start from a scaling limit and you zoom out, you get the same thing back. Okay, they don't change. Uh, so imagine now you're in a situation where you have two such fixed points. One that you understand with this one, uh, because it's described by Gaussians, and one that you don't understand, because it's not described by Gaussians and it's complicated. Maybe you don't even know the scaling exponents. Um, now, what you could do is the following. So suppose you have a one parameter family of models, say somewhere up here, uh, with the property that there's one value of the parameter here for which it lies, if you want, in the basin of attraction of this Gaussian principle. Right? So if you start with the model for this specific value of the parameter and you zoom out, you see something Gaussian and you can understand that very well. And now you take a value which is very close to this one. So if you zoom out, well, for a while, you would think it still looks approximately Gaussian. It looks like you're converging to that fixed point. But then at some point you realize that you actually started a little bit off. And then what happens is you sort of bifurcate and you end up converging to this other fixed point which you don't understand very well. Okay. And so now you can ask yourself, you know, how big 
is this kind of heteroclinic connection here between these scaling numbers, between these fixed points. Right, so an element here would be a sort of random field which has the property that it has, it's not self-similar, so it has different behavior at large scales and at small scales. So it would have the property that at small scales, when you zoom back in, it looks like this Gaussian field, which you understand very well, and at large scales, it looks like this guy, which you don't understand very well. Then you can ask yourself, are there many of these things? Right? And so here, here, the picture is two-dimensional, the screen is two-dimensional, and so it looks like this is just a line. Right? Of course, you should think of this as being the space of all possible models modeling you know, one class of physical situation. Uh, so this is some kind of big infinite dimensional space. Um, <clears throat> so there's no reason for this a priori to be just a line, right? something very big. Um, but it turns out that there are actually many situations where still this is basically a line. Like this is just one dimensional or maybe finite dimensional. It's described by very few parameters. Yeah, cool. What does it mean by putting two points close in this picture? Uh, so in this picture, having two points close means that if you look at them somehow at scales of order one, you see more or less the same. Right. And so that's in that sense that, you know, a model and the same model zoomed out are not the same, right? Because they don't give you the same answers when you look at them at scales of over one. So what happens when you take the point EW to the red line? No, here you can't move these, right? So yeah, yeah, this but there, is, there are some points that are very close to EW on the red line. Yes. So what do those point mean? Right, so, okay, so the thing is that, so the red line is just one single, so in this example, so there would be just, there's one single model, which is a point on the red line, All right, so moving forward and backward here is simply taking the same model and just look at it either larger scales or smaller scales, right? So moving back and forth here doesn't, if you want, change the model you're looking at, it only looks the scales at which you look at things. So what it means here, so the fact that, it, that at small scales it goes to this fixed point, it means that this is a model which has the property that if you look at it at very small scales, if you sort of go and take a microscope and sort of zoom in into the behavior at small scales, then it looks very similar to the behavior of this guy. Whereas if you zoom out and you look at its behavior on large scales, then it looks very similar to this one. Right. That's what it means. How do you see things in the space? Is there some functions on this infinite dimensional space that you use as coordinates? Like How do you see the model? Okay, so the here, so, you, so typically, if you want to formulate anything like a theorem which somehow shows that a picture like this holds, of course you would just restrict yourself to some class of models and then you would have a bunch of parameters that parameterizes these specific classes. Uh, but the point is the type of picture you end up seeing tends to be something like that. You're taking all random variables on the space of models. Um, on, on, the, on the space of one model. On yeah, the so you would have, I mean the thing is that you have there's a, there's a lot of choice here, right, of what, you, what kind of models you want to look at. Yeah. It can be interesting, even if both sides are free, but different, different things. Right? Yes. That's what happens in the MS. Um, okay, so here are two examples of what so these are examples that if you want to describe what happens on this red line. Okay, so, that, so now what we're going to do here in these lectures, we're going to look at situations where time comes in. So we look at uh, systems that have a time evolution, like for example this Galois dynamic that we described for the easy model. 
Um, and there it turns out that these crossover regimes, if you're in the situation where the small scale behavior is described by the free field, then these crossover regimes tend to be described by stochastic PDEs. Okay, so, so here a stochastic PDE, well, okay, so let's take the first example. Uh, so in the first example, so you have your random function h, which depends on one space variable x and one time variable t. Uh, and it solves an equation which is a heat equation plus some nonlinear term plus this psi here, uh, which represents space-time white noise. Okay, so you should think of that psi guy as being a random term which just gives independent random variables at every point in space-time. Now, it's not like your second example. Is this like your second example? The uh, random right. So the, ra the second example would be this guy. Mm -hmm. So if you test without the nonlinear term. So if you remove the nonlinear term, then what you see here is essentially a natural evolution for the free field. Free field being the second example with the, the hexagon. So yes. Color. Yes. And the, okay. the so that's color. the zeta. Uh, so no, so it would be so the solution to this equation oh, would, be that. would be a natural time evolution for that. What we conjecture could be a natural time evolution for that. Because for example, the way I can take a time evolution in that case is I can take at any so here the natural time evolution would be uh, you have clocks on every side. If the clock here rings, then if these three values happen to be the same and I can change this value. That just right? So if the values here are 3, 3, and 3, that means the value here has to be either 2 or 4. And so if it's 4, you make it 2. If it's 2, you make it 4. Okay, so that would give you a natural uh, time evolution on these kind of random configurations. And what you would conjecture is that if you take the scaling limit of that evolution, then you just get an equation like this. Well, well, because x will be 2 dimensional. It will be like heat equation in two dimensions plus this white noise okay, without any nonlinear term. Okay, and so this equation, so they give you a natural, so just the linear part of these equations, uh, they are natural evolutions for the free field. Can you say what space time white noise is a little bit? So space time white noise, well, okay, so formally it's Okay, I can give you a precise definition uh, if I find the chalk. Not too uh, precise. <laughs> not too precise, okay. <laughs> so it's a random distribution. So it's Gaussian, okay? So now the Gaussian random variables are completely described by the covariance. So here the covariance is a delta function. And so in that sense, it's like having independent random variables every space-time point, because it means that if we take the covariance between the distinct points, it would be zero, and if it's the same, it's sort of infinite, because you're going to be zero of the delta function. So just a random fluctuation of the values at every point. Yeah, so you could get it as scaling limit, for example, you just take, you simply take independent random variables, you put a grid in space-time, you put independent random variables at every point of the grid. <coughs> Uh, and the size of these random variables has to be scaled in a certain way so you get something non trivial. As you make the grid size go to zero. What is the C for the grid? Right. Uh, so here the C is just a constant. Um, so this example, for example, describes some sort of crossover regime for the easing model. And it's the crossover regime between some kind of mean field version of the easing model, where again you have it's described by the free field, uh, and then the actual easing model like criticality, you have this kind of nonlinearity. And here, this is really two equations, so the blue bits are optional, and whether you have the blue bits or not, that depends on whether you take something like the global dynamic. Uh, or something like the Kawasaki dynamic, which is the one where you exchange neighboring space instead of neighboring space. Okay, so with the blue bits corresponds to exchanging spins and without corresponds to flipping spins. Okay. 
Um, okay, so, so now the conjecture here is that these kind of objects have themselves hypophilia in the sample. Okay, so, so the conjecture, so these guys have basically all the properties that I brought down on the previous slide, except for the scaling variance. Right, so they have translation invariance, uh, rotation invariance in that case. Um, but they do also have this kind of space-time Markov property. So they have a kind of space-time Markov property. And the conjecture in both examples, for example, would be that these, the solution to these equations are the only object with these properties, which furthermore is such that at small scales, uh, if, if you zoom in, it converges to the free object, which is the one way to remove the nonlinearities. And if you zoom out, it converges to the randomization fixed point, which we have KPD fixed point for this one, and the uh, sort of time evolution for the, uh, uh, the scaling limit of the easy model. You said jargon, I don't really know what that means zooming out? You said so, zooming out, does that mean zooming out? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> the problem here is that the, so these equations you can somehow divide them formally so you can somehow guess them. Okay. Uh, it's not too difficult to guess them uh, the problem is that at face value they don't have any meaning okay? because uh, if you take so for example this one so that's a simulation of the second one of these equations not very smooth not very smooth uh, so this thing you see locally, so that's the one which is supposed to look like the two-dimensional free field at small scales. Right? So at small scales locally here, it looks like a two-dimensional free field. And at large scales, it looks like the critical easy model. What? Right? Which is like this critical easy model, right? which is sort of what you see. This is evolving over time, what we're seeing? Yeah. So, so the time evolution here is just DPD that I wrote down which is supposed to be the kind of limit covered by that. In this particular case, you can answer. actually prove that. Sorry? Why don't we just take the film to be the answer? <laughs> right. Because you have to prove that there's a limit in film. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, what's the pixel size here? Right? So if I change the pixel size, you don't want the film to change. Ah. Right? So you see, so the, that film was a simulation of this equation here uh, without the blue bit. And well, as you said, it doesn't look very regular. So it's actually not a random function, it's a random distribution. Uh, but the equation here involves the cube of the solution. Right? And so then that's clearly kind of a problem. Uh, so it's not clear what it actually means to be a solution to this equation, because the solution is not a function, and so I'm not allowed to take it. You mean 10 qubit distribution? No, yeah, you can't qubit distribution. So, yeah, maybe yeah. special cases where you can multiply distributions, or, you know, you can give crazy interpretation of a <coughs> probable distribution or something like this, but then you get a crazy abstract object that doesn't represent it. Or it doesn't really tell you. Um, so it's not clear what this means. And so here, for example, the kind of theorem you can show, and the re right, so the reason why the whole thing is very irregular is because this guy is very irregular, right? Because this guy was some kind of scaling limit of uh, putting independent random variable at every point on the grid, and then it can be very fast to zero. And so this guy is a very irregular random distribution, and because of that, the solution has to be very irregular despite the fact that there's some smoothing that comes from the heat equation. Where did these two equations come from? Why these two? Ah, because they're basically, so because of the fact that the solutions are so irregular, um, sometimes there are not that many ways in which you can perturb the linear equation. And so if you take, this equation here, which is the linear equation, 
there are not all that many nonlinearities that you can write down which actually have a meaning. Well, okay, I just argued that that one doesn't have a meaning either. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the point is that we will be able to give a meaning to that one. Uh, but there are not many that you can even, you know, even by sort of closing your eyes and praying, uh, give a meaning. So, in this case, in two dimensions, there are quite a few. But in three dimensions, if you furthermore impose uh, symmetry, you know, that this guy is supposed to be symmetric and the phi goes to minus phi, which is true for the model, uh, then this is pretty much the only nonlinearity. That just aren't any others. So you're going to give a meaning. Yeah. Is it going to be in the context of some kind of unique solution or something like that? Uh, it's going to be something a bit different. Because, so you can define some sort of notion of weak solution for this. Uh, but the problem, okay, so not the classic, I mean, the classical notion of weak solution doesn't really help because testing this against the test function, well, you can't undo the cube by doing that, right? It would help, it helps for sort of giving meaning to this derivative because you just throw them under the test function. That doesn't really help you for the cube. Um, but there still is some sort of notion of weak solution for these, but unfortunately it's too weak, so it's, it's not known whether they actually characterize the solution. So it's known that the solutions are weak solutions, but it's not known whether every weak solution is a solution in the stronger sense. Than which is in some sense the correct. I mean, there's a correct notion of solution. And it's correct in the sense that you can get it, for example, by, you know, so this guy is very regular, so you replace this guy by any sort of smooth approximation of what marks. Okay? The only constraint, pretty much, is some kind of moment bounds and the fact that it's uh, stationary, right? that you don't break translation invariants. Statistic translation environments. Okay, so you take pretty much any approximation of white noise, which has these properties, and then the claim is that there is a way of adjusting the value of this constant so that when you make this uh, approximation converge to white noise, then the value of the constant you have to take will blow up, uh, but there's a way of making it blow up so that the solutions actually converge to a limit. Uh, and that it's always the same limit. The limit is unique. Okay, so that's the state. So in that sense, there is a there's only one decent notion of solution here, which is the limit that you get by replacing this by pretty much any approximation you want. Passing the limit. Limits? Sorry? Where do you take the limit? Oh, so the limit is just in some space of random distributions. Right, so, and actually it's <coughs> In terms of the randomness, it's even the limit. So if you have a convergence in probability for the noise, then you actually get convergence in probability of the solutions over the same probability space. Uh, and then the convergence of the field is just in some space, some space of space. <coughs> okay. So here's a general statement of this. Okay, so there's a very general statement of the type. So you start. <coughs> So that's a kind of synthesis of a bunch of works uh, with some of them with these co-authors. But you get pretty much any equation more or less of the type that I wrote down. You can have more complicated nonlinearities. There's some kind of power counting that has to hold. So the very important condition here is that the equation needs to be subcritical. Um, and okay, I'm maybe going to explain in the uh, third lecture, what subcritical here means, but it's essentially some power count kind of condition. Okay. Good. And means good. Means good. <laughs> and it's in that sense, for example, for this nonlinearity uh, I mentioned earlier on, they are very, so depending on the dimension and so on, so the higher the dimension, the more singular the thing becomes, and the less subcritical nonlinearity you have. Um, and then the theorem is that, well, you know, these guys always have a somewhat unique notion of solution, um, except that it's not completely unique. So the solution is always parametrized um, by some, well, in general, it's a 
finite dimensional neutral of the B group. Uh, in practice, in many cases, it's just one constant or two constants or something like this. Okay, so they are, think of them as being parametrized by a bunch of constants. Um, right, so the thing is that the, so in the sense that what I mentioned earlier, right, so you have your equation, you somehow regularize it. If you simply remove the regularization, the thing doesn't converge to it. So in order to make it converge, you have to actually adjust the values of some constants. So if you adjust the values of the constants in the right way, and it's in a diverging way, then you get a limit. Um, except that there are, you know, maybe more than one way of adjusting the constant. And so you could get more than one limit. Right? But the possible limits that you get, they are parametrized by that. Right? So there's basically, you have a group that acts on the whole space of right-hand sides for your equation. And you have to simultaneously send your regularization to zero and act on it with that group. Okay? And then you get a limit, but the limit is still you know, modulo the group element, sort of a finite group element. No, it's a group actually. It actually has an inverse. Can you think of this as the analog of scaling? Like you scale something and you scale something in the image? Not quite. It's really more like the analog of, remember I told you the example where you had a one parameter in this crossover regime, you have a one parameter family and you have to send the, you send the parameter to the specific value which you have the Gaussian model and it's somehow the thing that tells you how this parameter should be adjusted as a function of the scale at which you look. So is the word canonical bar from Wilson? We call this uh, canonical curve in this view of the normalization. Uh, well, here canonical is simply I mean, canonical in the usual sense, okay. and in the sense that there's, <laughs> there's one family of solutions which is determined uniquely by all the data that are given. Mm -hmm. and it's the only thing that you can reasonably call a family of solutions for that. Um, Okay, so there's a kind of continuity that you get, which is, so this is already what I just mentioned, right? Which is to say that, so in order to build these solutions, you regularize the noise in pretty much any way you want, provided that, you know, you have some uniform woman bounds in some sense, right? So there's some kind of constraints. Um, but then as soon as they converge to some limiting noise, the solutions converge to a limiting solution, but provided uh, that you adjust the constants in the right way. Right? So you, ju you don't just look at a fixed right and five, but you have to adjust the constants in a way that depends on your approximation. Um, but the limit that you, and then you get a limit. So, so you should really think of something like this. Right? So, you, so say you have a, a fixed epsilon, so you, you approximate your noise by some sort of epsilon uh, smooth noise, and now this curve here, an element of the curve is a solution and the different points on the curve corresponds to the solutions for different values of the constants that appear in the right hand side of the curve, right? And so now what happens if you send epsilon to zero, this curve, I claim, somehow converges for limiting curve, which is parametrized, right? So somehow this is parametrized by your elements G, right? Uh, but it's really the curve that converges to a curve. So if you simply fix the values of the constants appearing in the right hand side of your equation and try to send epsilon to zero without adjusting the values of the constants, then you might, you know, this point might get mapped here and then it might get mapped here and then it just runs off to infinity. Right? So it's in that sense that you have convergence of the family of solutions yeah, as a family. Right? 
but you don't have convergence if you simply fix the constants in the right hand side of the equation and send the regularization to zero. Okay, because that will just send you off to infinity. Okay, so that's what I mean by this. And the continuity here is really a continuity of you know, these curves. Okay, so I think I'm already you know, over time, so I should stop here. <laughs> Today. Are there any questions? I have one. I mean, this, you, is this like a general pattern to consider in this kind of solution? You have an equation and you're so sort of changing the equations, changing the parameters. I mean, it seems like a general scheme. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, and now there's a sort of pretty general black box. What? There's a pretty general somehow black box. So what I want to explain that in these lectures, especially in the third lecture, is we can somehow set up a whole theory in which you can formulate these equations. Um, and then you can, in some sense, everything behaves almost like traditional kind of parabolic PDE theory, deterministic kind of parabolic PDE theory. Um, Which is but right. it includes, it somehow, auto, in a way, sort of semi-automatically uh, takes care of this kind of randomization business. Yeah. Okay, two questions, both of them are stupid. When you talk about the plane, is there any earthly purpose to interpreting the points that plane as complex numbers or just not wrong? No, that plane wasn't really. Uh, I, I, I'm just, I assume that, I'm just guessing, I'm just guessing. There's a plane, I assume there's no point to be in the complex number. plane or which plane? The, the original plane. Oh, the, uh, which one, like this? So here, yes. If you're wondering in a plane, is there any point to looking at those complex numbers or not? You mean this plane? Here. So, I mean, so in two dimensions there, yes, because you have this conformal structure. So, so there, yes, in, in some cases. Just in many cases, when you do have this conformal invariance, then yes, you want to interpret these as common okay. sense. But then in other situations, if you're in three dimensions, three dimensions. And one other thing that's going to be you mentioned uh, Gaussian, Gaussianity is not expected when you have interactions. We have each other's interactions to go deviation from Gaussianity, right? What if I give you a deviation from Gaussianity? Can you pull information out of that deviation about the interaction? It's maybe gibberish. No, the thing is you don't... Can you reverse the <coughs> You can't do it exactly. You can't no, really you can give you the there is interaction. Uh, yeah, but okay, that, yeah, but okay. the thing is that you see, you can't really be given. So, yeah. the, the thing like is, it, there, there are very few of the, you know, you can't really exhibit these guys. It's very hard to exhibit the guy, except for the free ones. It's highly restricted. You can't just choose an arbitrary. Yeah. Deviation. It's very, very it's difficult to find a guy like that, right? You can't just write them down. Like a few guys. Yeah. It's sort of a few kind of yeah, it tries yeah, to do that, right, yeah. What At least writing down correlation functions, relations between correlation functions. So, I'm a poor country boy that only knows about Gaussian distribution. What is a non-Gaussian distribution? What's an example? Oh, well, I mean, I could just, so an example on the reals is very easy. You just take, I don't know, Cauchy distribution. It's 1 over 1 plus x squared as a density. You right. find that, that one behaves. You can find that, yeah. I can. Uh, I can show you some of the motion of the upper half line getting better. The country boy like Sam Irving is a country water. Is that one? So that, that process here, if you look at the law of increments, uh, it's essentially given by a Cauchy distribution. And so the reason why you see that it's very non gaussian is because you have this discontinuity form. Yeah, what? This discontinuity, right? So you see oh. that sometimes things are sort of almost flat, but then they make big jumps. Yeah, the big jumps. Okay, and that's, that shows you that the behavior is very much not gaussian because you have 
So if you look at the difference in values between nearby points, mostly they're very small, but sometimes they can get really large. So as Gaussians have a well-defined size, they somehow don't really change the model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And you still have conformal variance in higher dimensions, or is it? Uh, it always depends, yes. So in, in gen, for example, for easy model and so on, yes. If you add time, then that doesn't really help all that much. You turn this oh. off. Martin, <laughs> 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 the, 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 the big difference when you have, uh, when you have those uh, fat tail distributions is that the Gaussian distribution, they are symmetric. If you, if you turn them around, they, get, they keep the same shape. The, those with fat tail, they, are very, they have characteristic direction in which you have those extreme moves. And in here, uh, in your, your example, you have you know, the time and the space are very separated. And so you can have uh, uh, like a Brownian motion in with, uh, with uh, Whatever it could have taken the Levy process or something like this for the for the for, for the for, for, but if you are in higher dimensions, uh, then you will have to define in which directions you have those uh, those fat tails because elliptic distributions behave very very differently from product of uh, fat tail distributions, etc. So so essentially your your analysis seems to identify those uh, those uh, those characteristic directions of non gaussianity um, well okay so here okay, so, so that movie i showed with the where the Cauchy distribution showed up it's not meant to do with this talk right so it was not a simulation of one of these statistics it was a little different it was actually a scaling limit of some other sources where you have a non gaussian scaling limit which is still free in some sense uh, and it's not described by one of these stochastic PDs. So these stochastic PDs, um, you don't really have anything in that tail showing up. So these, these solutions, they locally look Gaussian. Right? So they are sort of perturbations of the Gaussian. So they, are, they locally look like a free field, so they locally more or less look like Gaussian. So they don't really have a factor. Well, let's thank uh, Professor Harr again. Same time, same place.